Okay, we're in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 to 26. Should always know the background on the book before you really get into it. Here we go. James, the half brother of Jesus, wrote this the first book written in the New Testament. I didn't know if you knew that or not. Chronologically speaking, this is the first book. That's disputed, but for the sake of our conversation, that's what we're going to say. And he was the half brother of Jesus, who at one time thought that his brother Jesus was a little bit crazy, has changed his mind and has written this book, a very practical book. This is what you like about James. He understands faith without works is dead. He understands that pure and undefiled religion is to care for widows and orphans. He knows that there's an action that must be taken in faith. And he lets us know what that is. He tells us how to control our tongue, how to pray for the sick, how to believe, how to ask for wisdom. I like the guy. He says our life is but a mist, and we don't really know what's gonna happen tomorrow. So live each and every day for today. And uh, he becomes part of the Jewish council, or the Jerusalem council, excuse me. He's the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. You read about this in Acts chapter 12 and 15. He helped make decisions about the direction of the church, the doctrine of the church. Whenever they had an issue, when the apostles would come home, they'd sit around and commiserate, talk about it, and he would be one that was weighing in on those decisions. That's who we're reading this morning. Okay, now, here's our image for this morning. It is an image that's entitled Metamorphosis up on the screen that that highlights the fact that there's a change that takes place in our life over time. For those of us who are pressing into the Lord and you're into the word and you're praying and you're growing in your faith, there is a slight, ever-present, we hope, change that's taking place in, in you. You and I are being sanctified. You are, we're becoming more like Christ as we go through life. I heard on the radio the other day, uh, one of these talk shows that knows everything about love relationships says people never change. A lot of people accept that. That is not biblical. People do change. They're sanctified. Uh, you read about this in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, that we are to be sanctified spirit, mind, and body. There are three areas of our life that are being sanctified right now, and they're in relationship with one another. Um, this, is, this is a change. So ultimately speaking, a man who looks in the mirror, as does this man, should see an image of Christ, the one in whom he was made in that image. We ought to be able to see ourselves differently than we did years ago. And if we've lost that trajectory and growth, we need to ask ourselves that question this morning, what's missing? And I hope to fill in those blanks. So let's talk about that. What do you see, by the way, when you look in the mirror? I know what you think you see, but what do you see? How, how we see ourselves is a big part of this particular message. How we see ourselves standing before a mirror. And I think when you look at yourself in the mirror, some of you look like maybe you spent a little more time looking at yourself in the mirror this morning than others. I'm not naming any names. But sometimes we just glance at ourselves in the mirror. I mean, we walk up to the mirror, and there it is, and okay, it's me, I'm still here. We glance at ourselves, and you immediately can say, ooh, man, I look good. Or, more probably pronounced, ow, I'm having a bad hair day, or I got bedhead, or man, I'm rough. I'm tired. Have you ever noticed that when you look in the mirror and see yourself, it's tired, it's, off, it's after three or four people have already told you, you doing okay? Are you tired? You all right? You know, yeah, I got these saddlebags under my eyes. You working too hard? I mean, it's pretty obvious, it's on your face. So when you look in the mirror, sometimes you glance at yourself and you see what you see. Um, sometimes you dislike the outfit. What's worse than having a cruddy outfit on? and having to do something fairly important, knowing you don't feel confident about what you had on. I don't know why that's so important, but it is. Some of you have a favorite shirt, maybe. I hope you don't have a poker shirt. Let's say you had a poker shirt. Sometimes you're wearing the right thing when you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, you know what, everything's okay, it's cool, let's go get it, I'm gonna go tackle the world. Or you're gonna make that special presentation, or I can remember making sales pitches in my career. If I had the right suit on, sometimes I'd say, yeah, I feel pretty good about this, I'm gonna knock them dead. And I often would. So when you glance at the mirror, I don't know what you see. But are you really seeing yourself? You are actually seeing a backwards image of yourself. So we're limited in that respect. Not only are you seeing a backwards image of yourself, you're not seeing behind yourself. We typically just see in front of us with the exception of the prom dress or wedding dress where you have a whole myriad of mirrors that hopes to show you what you look like on the sides as well. 
Often when you look in the mirror, you don't see your profile. And for some of us, that's a good thing. My point is sometimes we just have a glance in the mirror and we see the person we see all the time and we expect to see that person. I understand that. Let's move along, let's move along shall we, to a little deeper look. Sometimes we casually look at ourselves in the mirror and it's beyond the initial impression, it's more about, you know, I could stand to lose a little weight. I'm aging. Look how that hairline is moving, will you? What do you see when you look closer? We give ourselves the impression in front of a mirror that we look a certain way, but it's not an accurate representation of how we look as we move about our day. I've watched many people, women, try on dresses, prom dresses and things such as that in movies and whatnot, and they all stand a certain way when they look in the mirror with the dress on. But you never stand that way in real life. So your impression of what you look like in real life with that dress on is accurate if you stand there the whole time. But you don't get an accurate presentation of what it makes to move around in that dress or move around in that suit. That's a little bit more than a casual glance at yourself. Now, those are good too. A longer look at yourself is healthy, but I'm talking about something deeper still. I'm talking now about does our sight inform our sound? There are many people that can look at themselves in a mirror, and what they see in their perception of who they see in that mirror will actually inform how they speak about themselves. There are people, females mostly statistically, that can look in a mirror and they can weigh 105 pounds and see a 230 pound woman. We can see ourselves in a distorted manner, almost like the mirrors at the fun house at the carnival. It's a tricky thing how we perceive ourselves, very tricky thing. It can be a deep seated thing. Does our sight inform our sound? How we talk about ourselves, is it informed by our perception of how we look? Does our heart inform our mouths? Do we internalize our appearance in our hearts and out of the abundance of that heart does our mouth speak? Some of us have self-image issues. You don't like your face or how narrow or wide it is or if it looks like a pumpkin or your hair or your hair color. And finally, we just give up and say, I, I can't keep touching up the roots. I'm letting the gray come in. Let's do it. I understand all of that. But I'm talking about what gets into your heart that informs your speech because we tend to listen to everything we say. Have you ever noticed that? We always are where we are, and we always are an audience of what comes out of our mouths. And when we internalize how we look, because we've studied ourselves or haven't studied ourselves enough, we begin to inform ourselves that we are less than who we actually are. Should we only listen to ourselves? It's funny, a lot of people have trouble taking a compliment or receiving one. If you have trouble receiving a compliment, it's a sign, maybe, that you're not in strong emotional health. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, thank you. There's nothing wrong with saying, I received that. Or, oh, that was very encouraging. I, you know what, I needed that. I got a note today from someone in the church, opened up the thing, and I said, man, I needed this, right? And I told him on the phone, I said, I needed this this week. This meant a lot to me. Thank you for that investment. I received that. That's a good thing. Well, maybe some of you have been misinformed and you view yourself based on someone else's misinformation, someone else's verbal abuse, some ridicule you grew up with, some altered message and talking point that informed you you are not who you actually are and that still lingers. That's a problem too. Self-image is important for if we look intently at ourselves now, not briefly, not casually, but intently at ourselves, I think we'd have to eventually get into that mirror and look into our own eyes. Looking at someone in the eye is so important. Every time I meet a young man nowadays, and I encourage you, you men to do this, when you shake a young man's hand, before that becomes passe and 
out of fashion. When you shake a man's hand, you inform that young person, son, always look a man in the eye when you shake his hand, always. That's how you get the job. That's how you get the position. That's how you communicate. Always look someone in the eye because the eye, as they say, is a window to the soul. Question, can you look yourself in the eye? Beyond the hair, beyond the complexion, beyond the weight, have you intently looked at yourself lately? And by the way, what's in there? What is in there? In this highly busy, frantic world, have you stopped to take a long, hard look at yourself? What do you see and what do you refuse to see? These are honest questions. And aren't, as Christians, are we not called to love? And does that not include ourselves? For the second of the two greatest commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself. The problem with that is if we do not have a healthy self-image, if we do not love ourselves in an appropriate way, we have then stymied, thwarted, we have deluded, we have kept ourselves from fully loving others. For Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. If the church is perceived in this community or any community as not being loving, it may in part be we have a poor self-image and a lack of appreciation for ourself. And we can ill afford to have some sort of doctrine that says we cannot feel good about ourselves. We best feel good about ourselves because of who lives in us, who moves in us, and who teaches and instructs us and is available to us each and every day, Christ himself. So looking intently at ourselves is very, very important. Now keep all of those things in mind. A casual, brief glance, a more in-depth look, and then a deep, intent look. And it's that deep, intent look is, I think, where we bear the most honesty and the most fruit. I'm privileged to have a lot of young people in this church, young families, but I'm also equally privileged to have people that are on the 16th hole of life. And sometimes, why not today, Take an extended look at yourself in the mirror and get beyond the superficial, 1 Samuel 16 and 7, and look down at the inside of the man or woman. What have you done with your life? Where have you been and who have you impacted? And how have you used your experiences, your resources, your wisdom to leave your legacy on this earth? And if there's more to do as you look in that mirror, let's find out how to do that. For we have still this opportunity to do so. This is an intent look. When you're a young person looking in the mirror, and if you can get, by, behind the, get past the cosmetics and the makeup and the hair and the fashion, can you look at yourself in the eye and ask yourself, am I an influencer? In my God-given sphere of influence, am I a hammer or am I a nail? Have I what it takes to influence other people for good? Am I a leader or am I simply a conformist? These are honest questions. Now, it's with that same intensity that James beckons us in chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 to do something that I don't think is happening enough in the church today as it should be. Let me read it to you. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Let's break it down. Key words in this little passage. In fact, whenever you get a little passage like that and you're reading through a book, first of all, I encourage you to read a book in its entirety, not all over the map every day of your life. 
Read a book in its entirety and glean the, the author's original intent from that letter. What is his main thought? What's he trying to communicate? And park yourself in a book for a week or two. Book of James is only a short book. It's not even two columns of a newspaper. And I can say that while we still have newspapers, but it's about two web pages for the rest of you. It's not a lot to read, but stay there. Park yourself and don't move and rehearse every day what it was was said in that letter and get the author's original intent. Do not merely listen to the word, not merely listen. What is wrong with merely listening to the word of God? In fact, it's supposed to not return void. And Romans 10 and 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's nothing wrong with listening to the word of God. Hebrews 10 and 25 says, don't forsake the assembly as some are in the habit of doing. You are here, you haven't forsaken the assembly, and you're listening to the word of God. That is a noble thing. But it's not enough. Who really benefits from going to a church? Not everybody. How is a church ministry organized in such a way, and for whom is it organized, and when it's presented, this message, every message, that message, last week, the week before, to whom is it presented? It's presented primarily to those who are in the word, those who are in community, and those who are in prayer. Acts 2 and 42, are you in community? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They cared for one another as they had need. That's community. Are you in prayer? Ephesians 6. Pray on all occasions, all types of prayers. Are you a praying person? Are you in the word? And are you in community? If you are, then the sermons that I preach anyway will help you to grow in your faith. If you're not, you'll end up getting frustrated. Because I won't stop pushing, 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 pushing you into the word. And some will fall out of the boat. But this is not intended, a large gathering is not intended to be a small group discipleship. This is intended to give you the word, ask you to act upon it, to stay in community. That's what really matters. If you're not getting all you can get out of a church experience, two things are probably wrong, if not more, but two main things. If you're not in the word, the word won't mean as much to you when it's preached or taught. And if you're in a church that's not preaching the word, you're behind before you get started because you've been placed with the responsibility of bringing the word into your life without someone who's called to do so to do it, and that doesn't work either. So if you're in the word, you're not merely listening. You're investigating, like, like Luke. You're carefully investigating. You're seeking out. You're putting it together. You're following up. Like those of you who meet in revisit groups, you take these messages and you dissect them and you banner back and forth and you share things with one another. That's what it's about. Don't just merely listen. If you listen and leave, you've cut yourself out of 75%. You're living on 25% of what you could actually have. Go talk, share, do, manifest this word that you hear in your life, and now it'll start to mean something to you. If church is boring or ineffective, you don't see your life changing, it's likely that you're not taking what you've heard and infiltrating, mixing it into your life, kneading it into the batch of dough, so to speak. And we did have that lesson. Those in the word have the word dwell in them richly, Colossians 3 and 16. Let the word dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. Psalm 119, 105. Let the word of be your lamp unto your feet and light unto your path. There's got to be an integration of God's word through Monday through Saturday, friend, or you're gonna sit here on Sunday and come back next week and forgot what was said. And that's just what he's talking about. You look in your mirror and you leave and you return and you forget who you're looking at. We've got to integrate the word of God, be it on your own or use this word here, whatever it is, into your life. You, don't forget it. Look intently, he says. Don't merely listen. Look intently. How many times have you heard a passage, I mean, one of the most incredible passages ever written in my opinion, is, uh, is the 23rd Psalm or Colossians 15 to 20, chapter one, verse 15 to 20. It is the single most, talking about the supremacy of Christ, one of the most beautiful things ever written, in my opinion. And you can listen to something, you say, oh, that's beautiful. And, and you are some of the most encouraging people I've ever met. I mean, that, like you send notes and you say, that sermon really touched me, I thank you for your hard work and all, that's all wonderful, but, but, 
Is it making its way from your ear to your heart to your hands? James wants to know. Look intently. You can say a passage that's, oh, that's beautiful. Or how many people are arguing or debating around the, the cooler at work about a certain passage? They have no idea. They're misusing it. There's no intent look. There's no investigation. Or you'll hear somebody say, doesn't the Bible say somewhere so-and-so? If, if that becomes something you say over decades, doesn't the Bible say that, isn't that somewhere in the Bible? If you say that over a 20-year period of time, you're not looking intently into the Word of God. You're listening, but you're not investigating. For you know not where it is. The context. This is what James is saying. Look intently. Don't merely listen. Look intently into the Word of God. Don't eisegete, exegete. Fancy word for, let the word speak out to you. Don't read something into it with your personal agenda. Don't take our 21st century personal agenda and read it into a verse of scripture. No, let the author's original message speak to you out of the context of the entire letter, epistle, gospel, or whatever. Let's look intently. I want you all to be workmen approved who understand, know how to handle the word of God. Not just merely listen. Anybody can do that. To merely listen, you need only sit on your blessed assurance and sit there. I don't want listeners. I'm not called to minister to listeners. I'm called to minister to people who look intently into that word and begin to put it in action in their life. Don't merely listen, look intently, he says. And look intently into what? The perfect law. Oh, wow. No one wants to talk about the law. Well, the reason you intently look into the perfect law is because it brings you to a place of just total desperation. Desperation is the best place that Americans can be right now. And it's the furthest place that Americans are from right now. Desperation. I want a holy desperation. Don't ask the Lord for that. He'll give it to you. A holy desperation. Well, when you look into the perfect law, you realize, I can't do that. And no, I haven't done that. And yeah, I've actually failed at that. And are you kidding? I have totally blistered that passage. I'm a sinner, no question about it. Perfect, look intently into the perfect law and come to the conclusion you are on an island on yourself. You can't do a thing without the Lord. That's where you want to be. But you don't get there by looking casually or merely listening. Because when you merely listen, you dismiss things that don't sound good to you. I read ahead. My job is not to please people. Galatians 1 and 10, my job is to please the Lord. In a perfect church, I don't work for you. I work unto the Lord. Look intently into the word of God and see what it says in that perfect law and you'll come to a place of holy desperation. What happens when you look intently into the word, you realize I'm not, I'm not worthy, I'm not capable. Great, because once you do that, there, there is freedom. If you look into the perfect law, it gives freedom, James says. It gives freedom. You don't earn freedom. You don't qualify for freedom. You don't exchange anything for freedom. Freedom is a gift and you'll receive it. It's called grace. Once I realize that I cannot even be a decent pastor, once I realize I can't be a decent father, husband, once I realize that I am on, in and of myself incapable of doing what I need to do at the level I expect myself to do it, I have been, quote, broken. Now I'm in need of God to help me. The person who merely listens to the word comes up with the idea, yeah, that's great for you, but I don't know if that's great for me. Or I don't have so much problem at that area. Or, you know, I'm pretty good at that. And we dismiss it, and we return, and it's said to us again, and it, does, it, just, be, it just flies right off of us. We don't, we don't get it. We don't internalize it. Look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. And then he says this, and I like it because it's James-ish. Look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, to continue in it. The whole model of American ministry is based on Nehemiah chapter eight. In Nehemiah chapter eight, they built the wall in 52 days, and they called the high priest up, and he stood in something not unlike this right here, and he began to read from the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And when he shared that with the people, they all stood there and they listened. 
And then, if you read right there, just, be says, just before it says in, chapter, in verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength, all the people broke up into groups and talked about it. They didn't merely listen, they figured out how to put it into action. They internalized it, they conversed around it, they centered themselves, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so to speak. That's why you wonder why our service is set up the way it is, it's all based on Nehemiah chapter eight. Now, continue in it, not forgetting it. I think that there's an advantage to someone who teaches and preaches. Some of you school teachers, you understand this. If you teach continuing education, you understand this. The way that people see something, comprehend it, retain it, and it becomes a part of them rather than forgetting it is they teach it to someone else. They do. When you can take something that you've learned Teach it to someone else. If you're in the Word and you're intently looking at it this week and you pull out your book and you get into James, you say, I saw this this week. The first thing you need to do is you need to go share that with someone else. Maybe for their benefit, but certainly for your own. Because when you share what you've seen in the Word, it becomes more a part of you. And that's the backwards thing about the kingdom of God. When you give something away, it becomes more part of you. Just like the last is first, the first is last, and the weak is strong, and the humble are exalted. Give something away. If you're not giving anything away that you, you, you heard out of the word, like when you drive down the road with your kids or, 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 or whatever it is you do in your life, take something that you looked at and didn't just listen to and then go tell somebody it'll become more yours. If, if you have in your life the absence of sharing anything out of the scripture with anyone, it's an indication that possibly you're simply listening, if not even looking, and you have nothing to share. Sharing solidifies what you gave away. That's why evangelists, when you, once you start to evangelize, once you get momentum doing it, you're no longer ashamed of the gospel because you're in the habit of giving away something that's only solidifying more in your life what it was you gave, the gospel itself. Pastors and teachers are listed together in Ephesians 4 and 11 as an office in the church, I think because pastors and teachers need more than anyone else to be built up for carrying everyone else's burden, and the more they give away, the more they actually get. Preaching the sermons should be invigorating, life-giving, not exhausting, and depletive. Give away what you look at in the Word. Look at it intently, know what you looked at, receive it, chew on it, meditate on it, and go tell somebody, and it'll become yours. We have too much people glancing at themselves in the mirror and coming back next week and go, whoo, who's that? We have too many people looking at this book, reading it, listening, next week to come to church. What was that? What was that? No. Come on, we're we're disciples of Jesus Christ, we don't do that. Continue in it, he said, not forgetting. Give away. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do what? Holy communion. Do it in remembrance of me. What did he mean? Well, the Jewish Jewish meaning of that phrase is, don't like you forgot and all of a sudden you remembered. It's like, go relive it every time. Go relive what you did before in communion. Don't just go through an exercise. Relive what has happened on your behalf. Relive the broken body of Christ. Relive the forgiveness of God, and it'll mean something to you. You'll not forget its depth. Continue it, not forgetting it, and doing it. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. That's the original first Nike commercial right there. Just do it. You can can live your life like You can just live your life, go on, you know, go to church, and do all that stuff. But something happens. Every once in a while, when you intervene in your own life, and you take what you heard, and you put it into action, you broke a pattern of listening, forgetting, listening, forgetting, listening, forgetting, boom, done it, he did it. Now you've done something. You've taken, see, you and I are are justified by faith alone, but faith itself is not alone. If you received Jesus at a, when you were seven years old in a puppet show in a church in, in Iowa, that's wonderful. You were saved by faith. But if not a lot's happened since you were seven, and you forgot half of what was told you because you only listened, and you never put anything to action, that's a different story. James is saying, put it into action. Do it. Go ask for forgiveness. Go build somebody up. Go pray for somebody. 
take that word, whatever it was you wrote, and look at it, read, and listen to. Now, go do something with it in such a way that it looks like what you did is reflective of the word. That's the mirror. If you can take the Bible and hold it up to yourself as a mirror and say, yeah, I see myself in that book. I can see myself in that book. I can, I'm helping the poor, I'm giving, I'm generous, I'm tithing, I'm evangelizing, I'm building people up, I'm visiting the sick, I'm caring for the, for the elderly, I'm looking for a shut-in, I'm doing something, I, I'm sitting at the cubicle next to me and I'm, I'm praying this person into the kingdom. Now you look into the word of God, you don't forget that verse, do you? Because that verse is now connected with the person in the cubicle next to you. Do it. Christianity is too passive nowadays. It is, actually you and I are action figures. Superhero action figures. We have admission, a shield, we have armor, we have a lot of things going for us, do it. So I ask you this question. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Not ugly or beautiful, Not tall or short or fat or skinny. Some of those might be true, and maybe we've got to do something about some of them. Maybe there's some things we can do, and we should be healthy people, balanced people. All right, step one. Okay, cool. Look at yourself in the mirror. I'd encourage you to lock the bathroom door and take about 20 minutes tonight. Look yourself in the mirror. What do you see? Now open up that Bible, turn it to any page, and look at it and say, what is that book as a mirror reflect back into my life that I can see? Where do I see myself in that book? You might have a great answer, you may not, I don't know. Who, who am I to say, I gotta do the same thing. Am I loving, caring, compassionate? If not, why? Now I've been a Christian since 1987. 27 years. There may be some areas, and there are some areas of my life where I'm listening, but I don't see a whole lot of action. I'm perhaps not looking intently enough. And perhaps after 27 years, some of the issues I have in my life should have been resolved. Maybe at, uh, hey, how about age or 14 in my faith? Huh? And maybe some of us, been walking with the Lord for five decades, could stand and look in the mirror and say, ooh, hello, how are you? Maybe it's time. I don't know what it is. But there's something else that happens when you look in the mirror. And we tend not to see this. And we shroud it in a false doctrine of false humility and modesty. You look in that mirror and I don't know what you're gonna look like tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, and I don't really care what you're gonna be wearing when you look at yourself in the mirror, but I see a minister and a priest of the Lord. I see someone who talks to God about men and men about God. I see a young person for which no one, including yourself, should never look down on, but you're a, you're a person who sets an example for believers in life and faith and speech and impurity. I see someone made in the image of God. I see somebody who may not have all their limbs, may not have the best of health, but you've got breath in you and there's something for you to do and you don't just listen, you're looking at someone who does what the word says. You may have been betrayed, you may have, may have been adultery, you may have been walked out on, you, you may have been abused, but when you look in that mirror, you're a child of the living God and you're bought at a price and your life is not your own. You're a gifted, exceptional, set apart person walking towards holiness, and you, you have in front of you a vessel of eternal life. You are a walking tabernacle of the spirit of the living God. You are the wisest person on earth because you know where you've been, you know where you are, and you know where you're going. Everyone out apart from Christ cannot answer those three things. You can. You have a mission, you have a calling, you have gifts, you have opportunities, you have a God who knows the very hairs of your head. Regardless of what you think about your hairline, he has kept up with it. You need not worry about tomorrow that has enough worry of its own. You're looking at someone who lives in the moment, who walks as a steward of the Lord and manages every opportunity given to you and you have, you have the answers to the key of life. Question, are you simply listening to it? Or are you looking intently into it? Self-image. We don't like to love ourselves. We don't like to care about ourselves. 
We like to put ourselves second. You can line it up with the wrong scripture and make it look good, but in the end, you gotta care about yourself, you gotta care for yourself, and you gotta love yourself because to that extent, you're gonna love someone else. I gotta look in the mirror and say, you know what, I kinda like what I see. I like the effort I'm making. I'm making a lot of mistakes. I fall short in a lot of areas. But I'm getting it done. Each and every day, I'm battling. I'm pressing in. I'm doing my thing. I'm trying to do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm trying to listen to him. That's what I see when I look in the mirror. I can't see, there are too many people look in the mirror and they say, I can't look at myself in the mirror. I'm a failure. No, sir, no, ma'am. You ask God for an pair of eyeglasses, he will help you see yourself as you see, as he sees you. Now, when you look at someone else, and you see them at, on par with what you see in the mirror, and if it's negative, it's because of your own poor self-image. You will see others and I will see others as I see myself in that mirror and you see yourself in that mirror. And if you look in the mirror and intently look at yourself and say, you know what, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I must mean something to God, he died for me. You'll begin to see other people in a like manner. If you're down on others, you're likely down on yourself. If you're down on yourself, you haven't truly looked intently into the word who tells you who you are in Christ. Your identity is rooted in your own reflection and that reflection, my friend, is oftentimes backwards. Don't forget who you are. You will if you just listen to the word and walk away from it without continuing in it and doing it. You'll lose yourself. The world's got many people who have left the church and are now wandering about, having forgot who they are, for an absence of looking intently into the Word of God. You want to know who you are? Read about it. And act upon it as though you are who that Word says you are. You'll not forget who you are. In fact, you'll live an incredibly blessed life, which is the last thing he says. Young girls, You are precious and beautiful. You are a handmaiden of the Lord. You were bought at a price and your body is not meant for anyone else. Anyone who seeks to take from you what is yours apart from a marriage relationship is stealing you of your identity. and is in direct contradiction to the word itself and God. Young men, your significance is rooted in what that book says about you, not what you can and cannot do, not what your dad or mother think you can or cannot do, not what you think the world wants you to do, not what our educational says you have to do. You are who you are, uniquely made and set apart for a purpose. And if you read that book beyond a casual but an intent look, you'll find out you're acceptable just the way you are. And you don't have to go after young women to be someone other than you are. You don't have to make a certain amount of money. You don't have to do certain things in life to give yourself approval. Look at yourself in the mirror today, in the eye. Truly form an opinion of yourself and see if it contradicts that book in your lap. If it does, pick up the book, look at it intently, and do what it says. You'll return to the mirror after weeks or months, recognizing a new person staring back at you, one of value, one who is loved, and one who belongs. Think on these things. We're all justified by faith, alone, but faith, is not alone. It requires action. There's the word of the Lord.